thank you for choosing uh, to have your your uh, family or I should say uh, conference here, the symposium. We appreciate it. I, I definitely want to give a big shout out and thank you to uh, Ryan Demon. I know I saw Ryan earlier. Where's Ryan? Oh, there's Ryan in the back. So I, I want to definitely thank Ryan and his wife Jillian for being great business owners here in our downtown and made this wonderful investment in our fine city and uh, are your hosts along with Emily today. So appreciate it. They're going to treat you well. And again, thank you for choosing historic downtown Delhi. Uh, I definitely want to thank also Derek and Wasita. They've been great partners with what we've been doing. I've been mayor now. I probably couldn't come and do this job at a more challenging time. I got elected in April of 2020 when this thing called COVID and uh, a pandemic. And so obviously it was like, people were like, well, careful what you wish for. You're mayor now and good luck. And uh, so I think we've come through things really remarkably well. And a lot of that has to do with Derek and this fine organization of Lucida. So give them a big round of applause. I know you've got a, a great lineup of speakers today. I wish I could be here the whole time with you, but we do have our city administrator, Brian Wilson, if you want to just give a little wave to the crowd. Thanks, Brian, for coming in. And as I said, we've got a great lineup of speakers and various different topics. I want topics that are important to uh, strengthening our community here in the city of Delaware, whether it's our schools and working with our schools and do apprenticeship programs and other workforce development issues. So enjoy your time here this morning during breakfast and through the various uh, great speakers that we have here and uh, certainly come back and visit uh, our fine city again and I hope you get some time if you're not from around here and you're coming to our community for the first time to uh, discover some of the other wonderful businesses and restaurants and, and things like that here in our city of Dublin. So thank you again for Choosing the city of Delaware and welcome. Thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate all the, the work that you and, and uh, Brian have done. It's just been dramatic here over the eight years that I've been here, particularly at downtown, and in your business parks and everything. So I appreciate your leadership. Uh, Ryan and, and Jillian, this is a beautiful uh, venue. And Emily's been wonderful, so thank you. Uh, just want to welcome everybody here. I am Derek Tura, I'm the Executive Director of Lucida, Boulder County Economic Development Alliance. We're really excited to have everybody here. I want to thank our sponsors for making this possible. So we have Plastic Engineering, thank you. Precision Plus and Gateway Technical College. So really appreciate your help in just making all this Possible, you know, it's such a topic that's it's been you know every every year this has been the biggest topic early workforce and so we wanted to try to do something broke it into two parts kind of uh, around the youth portion talking about youth apprenticeships and then really importantly gaining a lot of momentum we'll hear a lot about that appreciate all our speakers that have come to participate so thank you. Um, I want you to just kind of sit back and try to take in a lot of the good information. The second half here, we'll hear from Michelle, Brian, thanks for coming from JW Speaker. Uh, they do some really that great work there, and she does a lot of great work in particular. And we have a few other local Elvin companies that we'll be talking about some best practices. So what we're really hoping is that you'll be able to you know, take a few good takeaways um, from each of the portions and hopefully uh, we can put that into practice right away. But appreciate everybody being here. Um, I did want to ask uh, Mike Reader to, to come up just for a minute. They've been a pioneer in terms of really investing in youth and career awareness to youth. And a lot of time, effort, and money, and you know, they're definitely seeing that return on that. So just thought if I could bring you up, Mike, uh, just for a minute to, to comment on that. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so again, welcome to the 2023 Workforce Symposium. I don't want to take too much time, but I wanted to, as Derek said, uh, talk a little bit about some of our lessons learned 
appreciate uh, listening to some of your speakers today and trying to take some stuff home with you. Um, our journey on uh, you know, getting involved with the youth uh, workforce development started a little over a decade ago. And it first started with uh, Upper Area High School and Gateway uh, Technical College, uh, right in my backyard. And, uh, you know, it started with recognizing, you know, uh, we, needed to be, we needed to change, we needed to do something different. And we had to get involved. Uh, get involved in uh, our local school systems, uh, get involved in the community. Um, you know, who are these people? Who is Precision Plus? What do we do? What are we about? Um, putting, putting, putting in place uh, all these names that uh, people hear about. So, uh, you know, we really looked to try and engage, engage as individuals and, uh, you know, help build uh, programs. And that's where the internships started and uh, the Prince uh, program. Uh, we got a number of uh, those individuals here with us today. And, um, you know, we really focused on trying to make that part of our um, workforce development is not just uh, your HR person's job or a person you got involved in training. It's a cultural part of your organization. Um, it's not enough these days to just try and throw a ton of money at people and hopefully they stick around. Um, you got to expose these kids to all the different paths that they have in each of your organizations. Um, there's a path for everybody, uh, which is why we're involved with not only you know middle schools, high schools, technical colleges, or four-year programs. Um, we try to show everyone there's an opportunity uh, for all. So, um, the one thing that uh, we don't want to overlook also is um, these county people to be able to promote from within. Um, promoting from within is a huge, uh, huge way to build up your workforce and um, it helps uh, it helps our individuals like, like these uh, see there's plenty of opportunity for them. Sometimes we get so caught up on the front end trying to bring these young ones in and uh, you know build them that we forget about once they're in what is that path for what was as they like in the organization. So um, real quick, just want to share a little bit of what we've learned. And again, can't say thank you enough uh, to Derek, uh, everybody who's seen that and uh, some of the local high schools we work with up from your high school gateway. Anyway. Hello, I'm Lisa with Boa County and Young Development Alliance for CEDA. And I just wanted to welcome everybody today. Um, this is really exciting times. I feel like we've really set up this year and getting everybody together and participating in career opportunities for our students. And I just want to thank everyone. And um, we've got some of our high school partners, a lot of our business partners, so thank you. And I work with the programs at Mesita with Youth Affection and um, Josh Hill's uh, company tours and things like that. So if you're interested in doing anything with your business, um, please reach out to me and I can contact my schools and uh, set something up for you. So I have my card and some information about my program that I manage off of the front when you checked in. So be sure to check it out. If you have any questions, just you know, give me a call or talk to me today. Thanks. Oh, yes, and I wanted to take it off. It gave from me a technical knowledge. Thanks, Lisa. Get two introductions. Oh, man, we're feeling great today. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Graff, and I am the Director of High School Partnerships at Gateway Technical College. Really excited to be here with you all today to talk a little bit about the Youth Apprenticeship Program. So, quick raise of hands. How many of you are familiar with Youth Apprenticeship? Joanne, raise your hand. Joanne, raise your hand. Joanne Pella, really quick before I get like too far into it, gotta give her a huge shout out. Joanne Pella. Really designed to, towards high school juniors and seniors. 
um, really combining occupational hands-on learning with what students are learning in the classroom. It is a one-year or a two-year elective program, really, again, combining that academic um, and technical instruction with mentor on the job training. Um, it has been around in the state of Wisconsin since 1991 and is really overseen by the Department of Workforce Development. And at that point, one of my favorite things about the apprenticeship program is that it's overseen by DWD, who also oversees the registered apprenticeship, who oversees all child labor laws, all laws. So they are a huge part of this program. And so in order to uh, have a apprenticeship program in the state, uh, we actually write a grant every single year. And I get to partner with so many of our local high schools in order to uh, really bring that grant to here in Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, so I work with, I think, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 high schools. Um, we keep growing, which is a great, um, a great thing. But I have a few of them here um, in the audience, so just if you could, Joanne Pella, again, California Area High School, and Mike Dolly with California Area High School. Yes, please wave, thank you. I got Chris Trotter in the back with CCA and Elkhorn Options, and Mike Rick, I have here with Elvin Deering and DD Tech. I think that's everyone here that's here today. Um, but like I mentioned, a lot of other high schools that partner um, with Gateway Technical College in our youth apprenticeship program. Um, really, some of the key components of the youth apprenticeship program is really um, the skills that students are working on. There is an, they have an on-the-job learning guide that they are working on. Um, for their 450 hours of on-the-job training. Um, and those skills and those guides are really developed by um, Wisconsin employers. Um, so DWD really actually is working on a modernization and is working on updating all the skills and really it's driven by Wisconsin industry. So students are really learning um, skills that they need today in order to be successful in those career paths. Um, really important, uh, students must have a skilled mentor um, that is assigned to training these students. So students, again, can start as soon as they complete their sophomore year of high school. So you're going to be working maybe 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds, um, and their mentor is really, really key. And I see you shaking your head, and are you a youth apprentice? Yeah, right? You need your mentor, kind of a go-to person um, that really is helping you uh, throughout your entire journey. Um, Students do have to get paid at at least minimum wage, but um, many of our students right now are making 12, 14, 16, I mean, I think $20 an hour. Um, so this is not free labor for you. Uh, you really do have to pay them, uh, mentor them, <coughs> and they do again have to work at least 450 hours for a one year program. And if students choose to continue on in that second year, then it would be 900 um, hour experience. Um, students, at the same time that they are out working with you, they're taking some sort of related classroom instruction, and that could be at the high school, or it could be at Gateway Technical College. Um, so a lot of the time, students, you know, going through the nursing assistant uh, pathway, maybe they're taking Gateway's CNA program, or our medical terminology program. So again, it's really that thought of applying what they're learning in the classroom on the job with you, with your mentor. Um, they have, as like I mentioned, the on-the-job learning guides for all programs, which is really developed by Wisconsin employers. And students um, do have to demonstrate that they are, you know, can do all of those things. So at the end of the, at, at the end, you do some fun paperwork, right, Joanne? Uh, you can submit to DWD. Um, but once students have submitted off and have done all of their skills, uh, students have the opportunity then to earn a certificate from DWD. Um, that they can add to their resume and their portfolio. And then uh, Nikki, you can kind of see you over here. Uh, students also have the opportunity in certain areas through the apprenticeship program um, to bridge into a registered apprenticeship. Um, so in certain areas like construction or manufacturing, uh, students could take those hours, maybe those 450 or 900 hours that they work to make the apprenticeship program, and they may have the opportunity to bridge all of those hours towards a registered apprenticeship. So it's really cutting down the time uh, for them to uh, complete that registered apprenticeship program. So I know Nikki and I work really closely in helping students uh, with that process. Um, so in the city of Wisconsin, we have 11 different career clusters um, that are available for students, uh, many different units within each of these clusters. 
Um, and a big, again, thank you to our, you know, you'll hear soon from DWD, who's joining us today. Uh, but they're actually work, working on their modernization to expand all of those career clusters. So coming soon, we're going to have education and training, uh, business management, and protective services. So really excited um, to really expand those opportunities um, for all of our students here in Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, there's a lot of benefits to these apprenticeship program, which I know you're going to hear from some of our employers here pretty soon, so I'm going to breeze through this one. But it's really, it's really an awesome program, an opportunity, like Mike mentioned, to get into your local high schools, build up your talent pipeline, um, and it's just, it's a really amazing program. We've seen so many employers um, who have hired a youth apprentice, and then, you know, 10 years later, those employees are still there. Um, again, building up your, your talent pipeline and, and helping students really see that career path at your company. Um, just some fun facts for you. Um, this last year, we had almost 150 youth apprentices in the Gateway Youth Apprenticeship Consortium. So within those 14 um, schools, we have almost 150, almost 150 youth apprentices uh, working with 124 active employees or employers. Um, those students, though, they raised all the, within their wages, they almost made a million dollars in wages. Isn't that great? $922,000. And I think, Joanne, when, I think when we, I first started partnering with you on the French program, we had like 26 students. And that was back in 2017. So, in just a short amount of time, we really have grown this program in the senior commercial law work program, especially. Um, and then, we, what I mentioned earlier, you do have to pay students again at least um, minimum wage, but uh, this last year, our average hourly wage for our youth apprentices was just over $12. And here in the Gateway Consortium, our top five programs are architect and construction, that has really jumped up here over the last year, um, agriculture, food, and natural resources, uh, manufacturing, health science, and transportation, distribution, and logistics. So I'm so excited um, to introduce our next uh, presenter. Um, John is coming from the Department of Workforce Development. Like I mentioned, DWD oversees youth apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship, all the laws, everything. And so John came down from Madison today to uh, be with us this morning to really talk about um, some considerations when hiring youth apprenticeship. So I'm going to turn it on to John. Thank you, Katie. So we oversee everything. That's pretty, that's pretty good. That's a lot. Uh, good morning. I'm John Keekaver. Uh, I am very happy to be here on this beautiful morning in this beautiful city of Delvin. Um, I am the section chief for youth apprenticeship at the Department of Workforce Development. I was asked to be here to talk about what it means to hire youth apprentices, some of the risks or some of the issues that come up with hiring youth and hiring youth apprentices specifically. So it's really the exciting stuff. <laughs> um, that's right. But that's my job. Um, and when I was preparing for this morning, I found that I was organizing my comments in kind of in the opposite way that I normally do. So I'm going to start with the, the, basically the conclusions. Um, give you some contact information because it's really about knowing who you can reach out to for answers very quickly to any of your questions uh, about employment of minors, uh, work permits, any, anything like that. Um, as Katie said, these are employees. Just want to be clear, that, that is a, a major point. This is, these aren't unpaid interns or um, just job or job shadows or any of the other work-based learning activities that go on, all of which have their place and have a lot of value. Uh, youth apprentices are employees, and so as employers, you know what that means. That, is, that means a lot of things. Um, some YAs, most of them, are minors. That then means a number of things, because we have specific laws in Wisconsin and in this country for employment for minors. The main point I want to leave you with, and I will say a few more things, but if there's any ever any doubt about what it means to hire a youth, um, you know, something going on in the workplace, anything related to employment of minors laws, used to be called child labor, please reach out to us at the Department of Workforce Development. 
and we can get you an answer very easily. Uh, we dealt with everything, and uh, uh, we'll get back to you and we'll have an answer and um, the security of that, that, that answer. But who is that? Um, I am an attorney, but I am not practicing attorney in this job. And so the folks who will give you the answers on employment and minors laws at the department are in our equal rights division. Our attorneys in that division actually oversee the state's employment and minors laws. And so they will get you clarity and uh, concise answers to any questions you might have. Um, you might have a workers' comp question, and I'll get to some of that in a minute, but we have workers' compensation attorneys who will answer those questions as well. And, and um, there's the YA uh, email, but uh, everyone knows how to look things up these days. Uh, so a couple of resources that I wanted to point out. We really want to get to this panel, so I won't go into these and show you what's all, all on them, but our Equal Rights Division on their website has a great guide for employing minors. It covers everything I'm going to say today and more, and someone's shaking their head who's used it. Um, they do a lot of good work about it, so I was putting together materials that are useful, <coughs> excuse me, useful for employers and for employees alike. So let's get to some of the substance. Um, we have in Wisconsin a list of employment tasks that are prohibited for youth. You know, uh, we actually have two lists because they're separate one for if you're under 16 or if you're under, just under 18. And in that Employment to Minors Guide, there's a list of those, a partial list of those, and then the full list is in the Administrative Code. One of the main things I wanted to talk about this morning were the exemptions to that, because that's where some misunderstanding lies, that's where some confusion sometimes lies. You may have heard of the student learner exemption. Well, so we have this list of prohibited, prohibited employment, but in some cases, uh, minors can do some of those things. Those, there are exemptions there. There's an exemption if you're a registered apprentice and you, you know, still happen to be a minor. Um, a high school graduate or what's called a student learner. Youth apprentices are student learners. So the student learner exemption applies to what we're talking about here today. They apply, that applies to youth apprentices. A lot of people don't know that that exists. Um, so those individuals can do some of those prohibited tasks. But where the confusion comes in, and I've heard this um, you know, on a few occasions lately when I've been at events and someone will, will talk about that exemption, as if to say, well, because they're a student learner, they can do any of these things, you know, that the prohibited list doesn't apply to them. That is not the case. It's a limited exemption. Um, so they can do some of those tasks, but only some of the time, to a small extent of the time. It has to be uh, incidental to the student learner's training and intermittent. What that means, basically, it's been interpreted to mean about 5% of the time or less. The main point here is that if in your workplace there are tasks or types of employment that you're interested in having youth do and there's questions about that, you think it might be prohibited, obviously reach out to us and we'll get you a clear answer on that. But there may be opportunities to have the youth do some of that work. Um, the main point is just to know that there's this exemption out there and um, we can help you understand what that means for you. Our uh, equal rights attorneys will actually, if you want, come out to your work site and take a look at the equipment or the, the workplace um, in order to answer your questions. Or they just do it typically by phone or email as well. So the student learner exemption is a big one to understand. Another resource, resource that our equal rights uh, division attorneys created was this guide related to manufacturing and construction. Uh, there are youth apprenticeships in 75 distinct occupations right now. It's about to be 79. Uh, and that runs the gamut from healthcare to IT to uh, about to be T 
teaching and other uh, good professions. Uh, it also includes the more traditional trades, or whatever we call traditional apprenticeships, construction, manufacturing. And so this is a guide that our Equal Rights Division folks put together where it lists all, a lot of the pieces of equipment and tools that are commonly used in those workplaces and describes whether youth apprentices can use those or not. It's just another resource that's out there for us. I'm going to run through a few more of the most common questions that come up um, at the department for youth apprentices. Work permits, transportation, liability, things like that. Work permits is an easy one. Work, youth apprentices don't need work permits. Okay. Hours of employment. We don't do a lot in Wisconsin, actually, as far as limiting the hours that minors can work. We really never, never have, kind of relative to other states. Um, but very simply, we don't limit the hours that minors 16 years of age and over um, may work, except uh, there is a provision which says they should be in school during school hours. Youth apprentices are an exception to that. Obviously, as you probably know, youth apprentices will often be working part of the school day at the work site. Now, different schools and school districts do have different policies on releasing students to do that. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but generally, they're exempted from that. Workers' compensation. I said in the beginning, these are employees. So they're going to be covered under your workers' comp policies. A question that we get quite a bit, though, is, are my premiums going to go up because I'm hiring you? You know, is there higher risk, and will that impact my workers' comp costs? No. Age, as many of you probably know, does not impact your workers' compensation costs. Uh, workers' comp is decided by different job classifications and how many people you have in those positions. And then if you're a certain size business, um, you know, uh, claim history will impact that as well. But simply hiring youth is not going to impact your workers' comp costs. Another question we get quite a bit is transportation. Um, transportation is a really uh, big workforce development issue around the state, and lack of transportation, transportation challenges. Um, but when it comes to youth apprentice and, and when we're talking about liability, generally speaking, the party that's responsible for the transportation is the one where the liability lies. So if a school district has a, has a program where they're transporting youth, their policies are most likely going to be covering that situation. Typically, though, youth apprentices, just like individual employees anywhere, are going to be responsible for their own transportation. Uh, unemployment insurance is another one that we get a lot of questions about. Um, again, generally, minors can file for unemployment compensation. However, um, if a minor is enrolled in, in, in school and they're, they're in a work-based learning program, like youth apprenticeship, uh, they're not eligible for unemployment. Like I said, this is the exciting part of the presentation. <laughs> Um, so, what are the basics? You know, this is just what I want to focus on. Whenever we hire anyone, we, there's some risk involved. Um, of time spent, resources spent on training, etc. Um, hiring minors brings some additional considerations because of employing the minors laws. But we have a lot of resources and people that are available to help you answer questions about that. Um, you know, we've got over 8,300 youth apprentices this year. Um, I mean, that's amazing. It's the largest program in the country by, by quite a bit. Uh, it grew by 31% last year. And the previous year was not low. Well, the previous year was the previous high. <laughs> so it continues to grow. And we know why. It's, it's a combination of the demand with the fact that youth apprenticeship is a time-tested program. As Katie said, it was started in 1991. So, more and more students and employers are seeing the results of the program, and it's time-tested. You know, we've run into everything that one could run into um, by now, and um, it's, it's just a, has a proven track record. 
So when it comes to hiring youth apprentices specifically, and you know, as compared to minors and using some other hiring method or program or off the street, so to speak, um, youth apprentices you'll find are very well supported. You know, Katie mentioned the mentoring uh, at the workshop, but also at the school. Um, so these are young people who are well supported and are typically quite motivated to be there. This is just my information real quick in our website on apprenticeship. Um, I did want to mention, because I was asked about the future of the program and expansion into different occupations. Like I, I was, Katie mentioned, we have programs in 11 program areas, or if you're familiar with the career cluster language, there are 16 career clusters covering you know, all, all jobs that are classified into those, into those kind of broad uh, categories. And we have, um, as Katie said, we have programs in 11 of those. We are expanding into the other five, and those will be finished by next year. So what we're about to release are YA programs in human resources, in administrative professional, in teaching assistants, assistantships, um, that's not a word, teaching assistants, um, early childhood educator assistants. So they, there's a lot of excitement about the new programs coming out, and that's, that'll be in about a month. Um, after that, we'll be wrapping up the programs that we're creating right now in uh, law and protective services, emergency services, uh, government and public administration, and human, uh, human services. And then we'll have programs in all 16 career clusters and probably about 100 specific occupational pathways. So it's an exciting program. Like I said, it's been around a long time. So um, you know, we've had a lot of time in Wisconsin to, to iron it out and to sort of encounter everything that comes up. If you have any questions, I really urge you to, to look into it and to, to reach out um, to your global consortium. I love working with Katie and Gateway and the other partners here. Uh, we have 36 YA consortia around the state. Um, that offer the program. About 75% of the school districts in Wisconsin participate in the program. We're always trying to expand that. Um, I think that's about it for me. We want to get to the panel, but are we taking questions or is that later? What do you think? Okay, are there any questions for me then before we get to the panel? Yes. Department they were in, 
And so most of them were really, really nice to me. And they really took it slow to, and took the time for me to understand what I was doing in each department. So if I really had to, I could go to any department and kind of work there. But uh, I ended up being in manufacturing as one of the operators, and I love it, and it's amazing. And that's my experience. <laughs>
he's still working for me today. So uh, it's just a great program. And uh, Alex is going to go to Fox Valley Technical School to be a diesel mechanic um, next fall. So he's getting a chance. We have a thousand acres, so he's working on all the tractors and getting hands on there. And I'm hoping that he comes back to help me <laughs> after that. And I will do anything. That's one thing about um, in today's world, we have to do anything we can um, to get him to come back and work with us. So uh, at the at the family farm, we really focus on making them part of the the farm family. So I'm hoping he comes back because mechanics, <laughs> hiring the implement dealers to come out is really expensive. And if uh, we can have someone like Alex around that, it would be awesome. Oh, hey, good morning. Um, so my name is Jake Sims. I lead valve operations for SPX Flow as well as operations excellence uh, for the company. Those of you not familiar with us, we're a global manufacturer of industrial processing equipment, primarily for nutrition and health applications. Um, I also have the privilege of serving on the governance board for DG Tech, um, serving as vice president there, so I've spent plenty of time with uh, Mr. Rick. Um, the youth apprenticeship program for us was really a business need more than anything. Um, going back a couple years ago, we had a ton of vacant positions. We're going into the workforce trying to find labor and could not find enough skilled CNC machinists could not find enough welders, skilled assemblers. Um, so we really looked at the youth apprenticeship to solve a, a business problem around um, labor force stability for the company. Uh, in addition, we had the same anxieties that I think a lot of manufacturers have around an aging workforce in this kind of five to 10 year window that's coming up where we're gonna see a mass exodus from retirements where you're gonna see all this skill set leave the manufacturing industry, and until recently shared in that anxiety, I think with all of those companies around what we were gonna do around staffing our operation. The uh, youth apprenticeships really changed that for us. Um, we just offered our most recent class, we had four in total students, we're able to offer 100% of them full-time employment. Um, and since the inception of the program, we've been able to do that for every student that's come with us has been interested in a full-time role after school. We talked about you do have to pay them. We have found that there's actually really a business case for hiring via youth apprenticeship. Uh, we see these students actually become productive about 30% more quickly than workers that we would hire full-time externally. We're seeing better retention out of that group than we would out of standard employees. Um, and it's just been a lot of fun. There's, we talk about all the benefits for the, the apprentices on the mentee side, but we see a lot of growth in our own employees uh, just through the mentorship experience and them getting to, to try something different. So um, yeah, I think for us, uh, we're trying to grow the program as quickly as we can. Um, we, again, had a class of four last year. We're trying to double the size of the program this year and go for eight. Fortunately for us, a lot of the high schools in the area have been doing this recalibration on the college prep versus career paths, and that's translated to us getting to work with a lot of great schools and a lot of great students. Um, certainly, Bell and Darianne, Elkhorn, I've worked with Joanne Funny, um, Bigfoot, East Troy, Burlington, um, so good diversity of schools and, and have just had an exceptional experience with these students and getting them in and getting them to learn. And it is actively solving a, a business problem for us in a real way. So um, we certainly have had our executive team challenge us to say what percent of your new hires can you actually hire out of these apprenticeship programs. So it's been a, a great experience for us. Um, looking forward to growing the program this year. reiterate everything that Jake said, but um, my background is actually education, so I was 21 years in the education field, so it's been really nice to come into this youth apprenticeship program that SPX School already had in place and help develop that more. We certainly have seen um, 
great apprentices come through and become great employees. And I will say, like Jake said, it, it definitely helps our entire workforce because they may not be their direct mentor, but pretty much everybody that's associating with them has invested in them and helping them. We were just we did an interview last night, and one of the things that one of our apprentices that was hired last year told her that the best thing was was the employees that they got to work with because everybody is there and everybody is helping. So it's definitely not going to be a professional program for everybody, not just the apprentices at home. Yeah, I just thought I was looking at Joanne and thinking about one of the apprentices we had last year. Uh, you don't actually have to give up the influencer dreams if you want to be the youth apprenticeship. <laughs> um, we, we had a student that was featured in some of our ads and got a lot of media time and just basically became like a B-list celebrity. I think every, <laughs> every student we talked to in the area knew about him. So you can do both. <laughs> Maybe they've taken on a project or they've 
taken a new hire under their wing. So they've already done that mentorship piece of it. And so usually they're they're pretty well equipped. Just a different age bracket that they're that they're mentoring. We just utilize our orientation program that we do for new hires. And so yeah, we, we buddy them up with a preceptor and they stay with that same person I and mean, they follow up with me, um, how they're doing, if there's any concerns or anything that keep them going. Well, we're on a such a small scale, so I'm the owner slash mentor slash Everything. So, <laughs> uh, there's no certain program. It's just me teaching. Hopefully, in a future uh, mechanic at my farm. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll sit down here this time. <laughs> <laughs>
continuing, but it, I just get up and just tell myself that that's kind of part of the learning experience that you just have to overcome. And I just keep getting up and keep going, and I just eventually, I got over the fear of that and started making better parts. <laughs>
being in a youth apprenticeship really, for me, solidified it that I really wanted to go into marketing. So I think that really, like, that aspect of youth apprenticeships is really helpful for kids to be able to kind of get that experience and really feel out what it's like to actually do the job in the industry. Um, so that really solidified it for me. And then Precision Plus has been very, very, like, uh, like we've had those discussions about continued ed education and like after high school and kind of what that looks like. And for me, I'd love to stay there. It's such a great culture. And so, yeah, I don't know what you but, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so adding on to what David said, I agree, they're amazing, and I would love to stay with them forever. But, <laughs> um, but I do, I want to go into civil engineering. And manufacturing isn't quite that, but I do love what I do. And so I would love to come back and I've talked with them as well and they said they'll have me back if, you know, if I'm still offered. And of course I said yes. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'll stay with them as long as I can because they're really great people. But I, life takes me down a different road. That's how it has to be. <laughs>
And I, I would accredit most of it to programs like this that help bring in new staff and you, you raise them up and um, it's just a great for us. Um, I think it's really important to make them a, like an official employee and treat them like everyone else. You gotta be really careful not to make that apprentice special. Because um, the other employees don't want, like, especially on a farm, there's not so fun jobs, and then there's the fun jobs. <laughs> and if I just let Alex do all the fun jobs, all the other employees are not going to be happy. Um, and also, I want him to come back, but I also want him to come back uh, for the right reasons. And if he's only doing the fun jobs, he, when he comes back, he's not going to be doing only the fun jobs. So you want to give a realistic, uh, experience to them what it's really going to be like when they come back and start doing their full-time job year-round, year after year, year after year. So uh, making it a realistic experience, I guess, is the most important thing. Okay, I think my director has the last question. He has the last word. <laughs> Well, just one thing I wanted to throw out to the group. So mostly what I hear, you know, when I'm talking about that with people and companies that are doing it, is the insurance question. Like, oh, we'd love to do it, but our insurance doesn't allow us to have anybody under 18 now. Thankfully, I'm hearing more and more. I know uh, medical health care was a tough one, but thankfully now they're, they're starting to do that. More and more, even the larger companies are doing that. But I don't know. John from DVD or anybody that's got around that, if you just want to make a quick comment about that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, we encounter a few different situations. I mean, there are, in, in some industries, there are national, you know, there might be a federal law, there might be a national standard or licensing issue. So, I mean, there are sometimes when there are those limits. Um, I think. What we encounter more than anything, though, are companies that think there are limits that actually aren't, that, that don't exist. And they may have heard something from their insurance uh, company uh, that's incorrect. That happens quite a bit. Um, or um, maybe it's just in the history of that employer, they've had a pol an internal policy to do something a certain way. So while there are actual limitations out there in some cases, most of the situations that we encounter, it's a, uh, a lack of knowledge or misunderstanding, or just an employer's you know, business decision. Like you'll make your own decisions about you know, who you hire. Um, but on the actual legal limitations, uh, there are fewer and fewer of those that exist. Again, that's just simply based on the incredible demand for employees and industries are starting to respond to that for the employers in those industries. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add? Okay. But again, we can help you figure that out too. Well, why don't we get started here for the second half of our program. I hope everybody's gotten food or coffee, water, that kind of thing. And you're welcome to get up while we're doing this here. But uh, second part of the program, we really wanted to focus more on the talent attraction, retention, some of those pieces. And so well, we have three speakers. Our first one, um, Michelle Reiner, she's from GW Speaker. She's the talent acquisition manager. And we had invited Michelle to speak to a manufacturing group that we do called Me in Wallace County. We usually rotate that around to a certain facility, they'll get a tour, and sometimes they'll bring in a speaker. But uh, that was probably five years ago, I'm thinking. 2018, yeah. So, and uh, just really appreciated everything she had to share and just the the way that the company has grown and how she's capitalized on it. And so, just, uh, I, I told her actually, I've relayed a lot of some of the things you've done, but I know post COVID things have changed. So, I'm looking forward to, to hearing a little bit more about that. So, I uh, appreciate you coming, getting here early this morning, and uh, I'll, I'll let you take over here. I've got this all queued up for me. And if you're in trouble, just be right there. So. I will. Don't worry. All right. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, I said to Derek a couple of times today, I, I'm not sure how I ended up here, uh, but I'm glad to be here. I know back in 2018, uh, when you originally reached out to us, you were looking for a manufacturing company that wasn't anywhere near Walmart County. So um, I think you wanted to just hear what people on the other side of town are doing, right? And uh, so that's how I ended up here. And I, um, I just want to share with you a little bit about what our company is doing. And um, maybe you can take away some things that you have thought of, or maybe it's just going to reconfirm some of the things that you're already doing. So um, as Eric mentioned, my name is Michelle Greiner, and I've been with JW Speaker since 2009, so I'm on year 13. And I've got about 30, 30 years of recruiting experience, sadly. And <laughs> um, so I've been around the block and uh, seen a lot of things in my time. So let me just share with you a little bit about what we do at JW Speaker. So as I mentioned, I've got about 30 years of experience. So if you do math, you can figure out that I'm a child of the 70s. And as a child of the 70s, I loved Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That was my favorite movie, um, awesome movie. And I find myself talking all the time at work about the golden ticket, right? We, we, what is the golden ticket for recruitment? What is the golden ticket for employee engagement or retention? We are constantly looking for that golden ticket. And so I had a little fun and um, built some Willy Wonka themes around here. So bear with me today. Okay, a little bit about our company, just so you know, I uh, guess the scope of where I'm coming from. So we have four locations. All of them are located in Germantown. And um, we do not actually make speakers, in case you didn't know that. Does anyone know what we do make? Now, we are actually a lighting company, okay? And um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have four locations. We have about 650 employees. And when I started, we had 200 employees. So we've grown a lot over the last 13 years. We're about 200 million in sales today. When I started, we were about 100 million in sales. We are privately held. Two brothers own our business. Their grandpa started the business um, almost nine years ago. Okay. We are very vertically integrated. We make as much of our product in-house as possible. So what does that mean? Um, I know I'm in the world of plastics in this area. We do our own plastic injection molding. We have about 25 presses and four metalizers. We buy raw circuit boards and we populate them. So we have our own surface mount facility. And uh, we have a wire harness department. And then of course our wireless department is final assembly. We also uh, have an R&D department. So we, design, we are working on the future of lighting. And then we design everything in-house and we test everything in-house and then we build it in-house. You do not find that um, in a lot of places of a lot of manufacturers these days. We are committed to staying in Germantown, no intention of moving anything overseas. Okay, uh, a little bit about our customers, just so you know who we're dealing with. 80% um, of our business is OEM business. Customers that you would know are gonna be Harley Davidson, John Deere, Polaris, Case New Holland, Articat, BMW Motorcycles, uh, Lotus. So we will never build lights for car manufacturers in Detroit. We are not a commodity. Uh, if you are building a million dollar car, we will put the lights on it. Okay? We are not the cheapest product out there. It's a okay? All right. So um, what do we hire for? We hire about 100, I'd say 80 to 100 employees every year. If you add in the temps, uh, I don't want to scare you, but that's about 250 employees a year. And uh, who are we hiring? We are hiring certainly the biggest uh, population of production, and that's electronic technicians, mold operators, assemblers, etc. Uh, lots of engineers. We've got over 100 engineers at our company. Design engineers, electronics, test, manufacturing, test 
and automation, plastics, s and industrial, optics, R&D, quality, you name it, we hire a lot of engineers. Uh, supply chain, HR, IT, accounting and finance, sales, marketing, continuous improvement. So it really runs the gamut. Okay, for any of you that do hiring at your company, um, I'm guessing you have someone like your results here, uh, who you call a hiring manager, right? Uh, who is saying, I don't care how, I want it now, right? So uh, there's a lot of hiring managers, at least at our company, who um, don't really understand the landscape of hiring today and just expect it to be very um, smooth and easy. My boss says we make it look too easy for them. We should let them feel like, hey, you never know, so what? Um, but we are constantly pushed uh, as a lean manufacturer, we have a big focus on continuous improvement. We are constantly pushed to improve our processes. So uh, we are not allowed to have any kind of status quo at our company. Um, so we're always trying to think outside the box, which I would imagine most of you are today too. Okay, so how did we how did we start, right? Thinking out of the box and um, getting creative because you're all hiring. Right? That's not a secret. We've got a lot of competition these days. No matter where you look, you drive through the industrial park and everyone's got an out there and sign up. And so what we've been doing is um, the first thing we had to figure out is what, why do our employees work at our company? So what's our employee value proposition? If you don't know why your companies work, for, or why your employees work at your company, what, how are you selling your company, right? What are, what are you talking about? And we went through a very simple process. Now, I can assume that I know why our company, or our employees work at our company, but we did something really easy. We had some meeting, I actually don't even know what it was. Probably like a benefits meeting or something. And we, held, we put big pieces of paper on the wall, and we just wrote some questions on there. What do you love about your job? You know, um, what keeps you coming to work every day? If you were going to leave, why would you leave? And we put little sticky notes there. And, our, and we encouraged our employees to just go up and, and fill out a sticky note and answer the question. And um, the good news is there weren't a lot of surprises. Um, we actually, it just confirmed, reconfirmed what we thought we already knew. Uh, why our companies work, why our employees work for our company. And uh, just for the record, those reasons were things like working with cool technology, working with people who um, want to see me succeed, that type of thing. And so what we did is we built an employee value proposition around there. We came up with our, I guess, model, um, uh, you know, driving technology, building bright futures, what we go by. And that's really why our employees work there. So now I've got something to sell. When, I, when a, another associate that I'm interviewing, a candidate that I'm interviewing asks me, why do I want to work for your company? Now I have a reason, right? I can say, we build really cool products. And we're all, um, you know, we're all in the boat rowing in the same direction. Everybody wants you to succeed. The next thing uh, I'd like to talk about is who is selling your company? Now, I know that some of you probably have small or smaller companies here, whether you're manufacturing or not, and your HR, may, HR person may be the person who is doing all the HR work and then all the recruiting as well. And that was us for a long time. Uh, I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, but a lot of times people do not go into HR to recruit. That's not their number one reason they go into HR. They may love people, and they love helping people, but it's not necessarily on the recruiting side of things. You have to put thought into who is selling your company. That recruiter is the face of your organization. They are out there um, talking to people and um, encouraging people and you know, selling your story and that may not be your HR person. It may not be, um, I think you just have to think out of the box is all I'm gonna say about that situation, okay? 
Uh, and I'm not, again, I'm an HR person too, so I'm not here trying to bash HR people. But um, the recruiting process is a sales process. And back in the day, maybe 10 years ago, an associate, a good candidate, had a shelf life of 24 hours. And I'll guarantee that's cut in half these days, right? If you find a good associate, they are getting multiple offers, and you have to act quickly. My number one thing that I do in my team all day, we have our email up all day long. We are responding to candidates within an hour during the workday. I don't expect that at night. But you have to be on top of that. You have to be responding to these people quickly, and you have to get them in quickly. If someone applies today, you can't bring them in in a week. And then you can't wait two weeks to get them an offer. Okay? You have to get this process moving quickly. And if I am the sole HR person at my company, how am I getting all that done? How am I dealing with employee relations and benefits and uh, performance management and all that other jazz, right? So um, if you take anything away, it is, it is speed of dealing with these associates if you want the good candidates, okay? Okay, and then um, who are you trying to attract? Right, so we have something with our uh, with our hiring managers. Every time we get a new order, we ask our hiring <coughs> managers to sit down with us and have what we call a target meeting. And during that target meeting, we bring out the role definition and we have a conversation with them about what do you want that's not on this role definition. We want to make sure that we are on the same page because when we go out to the market and start recruiting for this position. You and I have to be lockstep on that. We need to make sure that we are selling the, the, the stick, we're singing from the same uh, choir book, right? And that isn't always the case. And you have to have the courage that when you bring in a couple of candidates, like the manager asked, and then the manager changes their tune, you have to pause. You have to say, we gotta get our crap together. We're gonna look stupid. We have to make sure we know what we're selling. And so you've got to have, um, that recruiter has to have a voice and they have to be able to use it for that iron manager, okay? And so what we did um, after, after that is we spent some time looking at uh, our associates to say, who's sticking, who, who works and who doesn't work? And so we took some data and we went back maybe two or three years, and we looked at all of our production folks, where they came from, and if they are still at our company, uh, which ones were promoted, and which ones went out in a blaze of glory, okay? <laughs> yeah, to put it mildly, I guess. And um, there's a couple of interesting things that we found. So we found that there are three areas that worked for us. So to be a production associate, we found people that had previous manufacturing experience did awesome at our company. It didn't have to be specifically in the same area, but they knew what to expect. They'd worked in manufacturing before. The second thing was fast food. If we could get somebody that came from a fast food environment, they would kill it because they are used to being on their feet. They're used to building a product. Um, they're used to the fast-paced environment and it just worked. And the third area was retail, okay? So if we could get someone from retail, again, people who are on their feet all day long, they're moving around, um, they might have to change gears quickly and um, provide good customer service. We found that those three areas were the three areas that stuck for us. What that means is we also found other areas that didn't stick for us, right? Um, we found that people that came from, I don't know, let's say you've been working in an office for 10 years and you want to try manufacturing. That usually doesn't work out for us. Um, my least favorite, um, people that have been home health care aides, right? Uh, those folks that come over, they just weren't sticking. They were just lasting for a couple of weeks in that. Um, and also things like security guards or, you know, um, maybe other jobs where you're sitting a lot of the time and doing the same thing over and over again. That's 
that's not our environment. That doesn't work for us. So we set out and said, okay. Uh, we told our staffing partners, we told our hiring managers, these are the three areas that we want to focus on. Send us those folks, and by God, that it works. It's working for us. Okay, so there are some fundamentals that we, we do utilize, and I don't need to spend a lot of time on that because I'm assuming you guys are utilizing these fundamentals as well. We post jobs, right? So we post jobs on our website. We post jobs on Indeed. Don't get me started on that. Um, HR <laughs> folks can be uh, in my game. Necessary evil. I'm throwing money out the window with Indeed. It's a total waste, but you gotta do it. Uh, I hope nobody here works for Indeed. <laughs> um, it's, it's really a necessary evil. Um, and of course, other websites, Milwaukee Jobs, and LinkedIn, and all that other stuff uh, we are doing. Uh, we also have a robust referral program. So about 50% of our associates that we hire come through our referral program. We do offer a $1,000 referral bonus um, when someone gets hired. Um, we do have promotions throughout the year where it's double your referral bonus, that kind of thing. Um, and then of course we have job fairs. We, we go to job fairs and we host job fairs on our, at our facility. So all that kind of stuff to me is just the basics that all of you I'm sure are doing at this point. Okay, so what have we done that is what I would consider out of the box? Now what's out of the box for us, you guys maybe have been doing for years. I don't know, but this is a little bit about our journey and, and the kinds of things that we need to do to um, attract those you know, 80 to 100 people we hire every year. Okay, so you heard this uh, all morning already. Get involved with the schools. So I want to tell you a little bit about our relationship with the schools, in particular, Germantown High School. So we started out many, many years ago with the GPS program. You guys familiar with GPS? Okay. okay. All right, so I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, we had an opportunity when we built our facility to build a GPS classroom on site. And so we had the classroom on site and the students would come to our facility to go to school every day. So that, that was an automatic in for us. And then we got this opportunity where Germantown High School reached out to us and they decided that they were going to build a tech ed wing. And they asked our company if we wanted to invest. And our owners are big proponents in education and starting early and they said yes. And so they, uh, I know you won't all have the opportunity to do this, but uh, we were very fortunate that our owners gave a sizable chunk of money to Germantown High School. And so GW Speaker is, is everywhere at Germantown High School. So that helped to bring, bring to build our brand at that high school. So once we did that, we started offering tours of our facility to any of the kids at any level in the school district in Germantown. If it made sense for those kids to come over, we, we invited them in. So we started bringing people in, and what that did is it got, um, the teachers started to ask questions. And, hey, you know, we've got, um, I don't know, there was some math class where they said, we would love for you to come in and learn about um, design thinking or um, problem solving. So we started to be able to send different experts from our company into the school district to teach um, you know, one day lessons on anything in particular. Germantown has a very big project lead the way program, so lots of engineering classes, so we were able to connect with our engineers uh, to go up there and support those types of initiatives. Okay, so after all of that, um, and that had been going for a couple of years, we had high school kids reach out to us and say, I want to be an engineer when I grow up, can I come work for your company? And prior to that, we were like, oh, no, you know. Again, you're under 18, you can't come to work for our company. And uh, that was our mindset, and we changed our mindset, and we hired AJ. And um, AJ came, and he was phenomenal. And I think AJ learned quite a few things from some of our assembly associates as well. It was, it was quite an experience for him. Um, but what AJ did is, uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> learned a few things, but, uh, but his parents still let him work there, so that was good. <laughs> so what AJ did is, um, AJ was a popular kid, and AJ went back to school and started telling everyone about his great gig at JW Speaker. So what happened? Um, the word spread, and we said, well, AJ's doing a good job, so let's hire more. So the floodgates sort of opened, and we just 
started hiring all kinds of high school kids, left and right. And I'll be honest with you, it, it probably grew too quickly, and we had some challenges. And some of our challenges were um, maybe not what you'd expect. So the kids that we would hire were, um, they were the good kids. They were the kids from the engineering classes, they were in bands, they were in sports, um, they were involved in a lot of different activities, and their schedule was challenging, right? So we didn't really have anything in place to say, okay, students are gonna work in this area from this time, and um, how do we work our attendance policy with them? So it was a little bit challenging as we tried to figure that out. Well, our number grew to about 30 to 40 high school kids that were working for us. And uh, we needed to kind of pause and say, how are we gonna do this? So we built out some schedules. We got them all in the room and we said, hey, listen, you guys are awesome, but we need to um, do some standardized scheduling and we need to put together a process in which you can request off, right? So you're not calling today to say, I've got a test tomorrow, I can't work, right? You gotta do some planning ahead. Um, so it was a little extra TLC that we didn't necessarily have to do with our full-time adult um, associates. So to this day, we still have um, about 35 high school students who work for us, and um, the co-op program is growing. So now we've got about 10 co-op students, and they are able to be released from work at, at 11 o'clock every day, and they come in and work until about 2 or 2.30, and the rest of them come over after school. So we have been continuing to build this relationship with Germantown High School. We've expanded to some other high schools in the area. And in fact, we have a program called a teacher externship in the summer. And what that is, we have reached out to Germantown and other schools, and we invite teachers at any level, any subject, to come in and spend a week at our organization. And so we'll, we'll have them, um, we'll, We'll have them fill out an application, and then we'll sit down with them, and we will ask, um, what do you want to learn? You want to learn about HR? You want to learn about marketing in our company? You want to learn about, you know, ABC? And uh, we will tailor the week so they get to learn about that. We've had gym teachers. We've had German teachers. You know, what does, what does that have to do with manufacturing, right? You can't, you can't necessarily easily draw that correlation. But they have come in and they see manufacturing. I mean, you heard the students say, I thought it was going to be dirty and gross because that's how it's portrayed. Now we have all these teachers who are saying, wait, it's different than what you think, right? It's clean and there's opportunities. And uh, this happens to coincide with when our interns are still with us. And so we have our interns sit down and have a panel with these teachers where they can ask questions and learn about um, you know, how it's working for them. And this has really taken off. It's really a cool process. Um, I will tell you, the school does pay them for that week that they are at our company, okay? Okay, uh, I talked a little bit, mentioned internship. I'm sure most of you hire interns. I just have to take a second to talk about how amazing a, a good intern program will be. And we are very lucky in my time here, we have grown to about 20 to 25 interns at a time that we have every summer in all kinds of different areas. And uh, approximately 15 of them work year round. <coughs> we are in a situation where we are able to hire about 60% of our interns we hire on full time. And the other 40% is not because we don't want to, but um, most of our interns come from MSOE, UWM, um, Milwaukee area schools, and some of them are from Illinois, for example, or other states, and they just want to go back home after they graduate. So not only do we hire these interns and have a robust intern program for them, but we get involved in any chance that we can at that school as well. For example, with MSOE, we sit on multiple advisory committees. So not only the Career Services Committee, but we're also sitting in on Electrical Engineering Committee. You know, anyone that will have us, we are on that board trying to drive that curriculum and um, teaching them who JW Speaker is. So when they have a student that's a superstar, that's looking for work, they can funnel them our way. Uh, we, of course, attend all the career fairs there, but we're 
also signing up with any anything they throw our way. If they're asking for someone to come in and do mock interviews, we're doing it. If it's um, you know uh, reviewing resumes, we're doing it. If they need someone to come in and speak to their class, we are doing it. This is how you get excuse the, the term, but embedded in these schools, right? Where where they are thinking of you and you are uh, an employer of choice. Okay, the other thing that we had to do that was challenging for us is to reevaluate some of our hiring criteria. The first one was we had some, uh, I'll call it archaic um, things in place, policies in place. The first one being you have to have a high school diploma to work at our company. How on earth can I say you have to have a high school diploma to work at our company? when we now have 30 high school kids who are killing it. How, how can I keep saying that? That's silly. And so um, what we found was a challenge for us. Uh, on our side of town, we have a very large Hmong population. Okay, So about 30% of our staff is Hmong. And um, in their culture, uh, there are a lot of what they consider elderly, and I'm talking 50-year-olds or 60-year-olds, <laughs> certainly not elderly. <laughs> uh, but um, there's a lot of folks who have come over from Laos, and they did not finish high school. And that was eliminating for us all of these associates who had a very strong assembly background, but they did not have a high school diploma, so we weren't hiring them. So we said, this, this is silly. You don't need to have a high school diploma to do our job. It is not rocket science. We are not asking people to do geometry or you know literature or that kind of stuff. So we got rid of it. And um, honestly, we haven't, we haven't noticed the difference. It, it's been a good change for us. The other thing that we struggle with, and remember, we're in Germantown, which is a not, not a very diverse area. So I, I realize out oh, here you, you have a little bit more diversity than um, we probably have in Germantown. And so we have this crazy policy at that time that I had to speak English to work at JW Speaker. Bottom line, that's all we do. And um, now we have some folks who were bilingual, but they had to speak English at work. Well, that, as you might imagine, is shutting off a whole other population of workers because we, we are too stubborn uh, to get rid of an old policy. And so we decided that we were going to um, start to go down the path of hiring non-English speaking people. Now saying that, um, we needed to really take a look at what we could handle in our organization because we, we didn't want to just open the floodgates and let any and all in because we were not going to be able to be successful in that situation. And so we knew, for example, that um, as I mentioned, we had a large population of Hmong, Hmong folks and a, large popu a larger population of Spanish-speaking folks. And so um, we had enough people in leadership that could speak both languages and could help us through this process. Because I don't necessarily want, uh, you know, a coworker who can translate to have to be translating performance management issues for some critical uh, conversations, right? So we want to have enough people um, in the leadership level that can translate for us. But it wasn't just, okay, let them in, it, it's good. You know, we can translate through an interview so we can hire these folks. It was stopping and taking a look at our orientation process and our onboarding, all of our work instructions and documentation. So we didn't just want to get people in the door and then show them how to work, but we needed to set them up for success. And that was a whole different level of challenge that we stumbled through, to be honest with you. Particularly with Hmong, Hmong is not a written language, it is a spoken language. So how do you take your work instructions? Um, we have many, many people who spoke Hmong, but they did not know how to write Hmong. So um, we had some challenges there that we had to work through. Uh, and we're still working through it, but to this day, uh, today we are in a much better place because we allow that to happen. 
and we're walking through it together. Uh, we did, as a side note, we did also offer to have uh, English as a second language classes at our facility. Unfortunately, we have not found a lot of people who are interested in that, participating in that. Uh, but it certainly is in our back pocket if we need it. Um, finally, we have had a long-standing relationship with a staffing partner in our area, QPS. I know they, um, they're in this area as well. And QPS, for many, many years, have been bugging us about uh, trying a rideshare program. And we said, absolutely not. If people don't have a car, we don't want them to come to JWP. You know, I, I can say that officially, right? But so, they, they have to be able to get to work. We are not wanting to get people on a van and bring them up to our organization because when we hire them on permanent, they're not going to have a way to get to work, right? So that was a challenge that we weren't interested in participating in. Uh, but finally, uh, we got to a point about a year ago when, uh, if I'm being candid, we were about $14 million behind in sales to our customers because we couldn't find employees and we couldn't get parts. So I'm sure. Uh, many of you have felt that same thing. And we said, we don't have a choice. We need to embrace this rideshare program. Now, let's scope it out if you're not familiar with Germantown or the Milwaukee area. Um, we're on the northwest side of Milwaukee. We're about uh, 10, 15 minutes away from Milwaukee. And um, if you're looking at the south side of Milwaukee, that's a good 30 minutes. Well, QPS had an office on the south side of Milwaukee, and they said, we will fill a van full of people who are legal to work, so put that fear away, okay? And have good work histories, and those are gonna be the same people every day, it's not gonna be day labor, where every day you got someone different coming in. It was the same people, and we said, all right, we'll start with a van full of 14 people, okay? Today we have four vans of people that are coming on every shift. The program has been phenomenal for us, and the best part about it is we are able to hire those folks on permanently. Many of those folks, it wasn't a transportation problem. It was, I don't know where the hell Germantown is, right? <laughs> they live on the south side of Milwaukee. Germantown, so that could be, you know, an hour away. We can't drive that far. And so it just opened up a world of opportunities to these folks because they're used to working on the south side of Milwaukee where maybe they're making $14 an hour, $15 an hour, and they're coming to our facility where they can make $17 to $19 an hour and um, different type of work. And so that program that we have been avoiding for so many years was so successful for us that it just continues to grow. There are a few challenges. There are some folks who don't have transportation that we have now fallen in love with and we want them on our payroll, but we can't do that unless they're, they have a way to get to work because they're, we're not on the bus line. There's no way to get to us if you don't have reliable transportation. So what are we doing right now? We are working on how we can um, fairly provide them with a sign-on bonus that's gonna give them $100,000 So that's got some challenges, we're working through that, but these are folks who have proven to be great workers, and um, I don't want to lose them just because they live you know, 30 miles away. So if you think that you're going to have a nightmare and your culture is going to go on the toilet because you're introducing people from another side of town, um, that is not the case for us. It worked out very well for us. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about from a recruiting standpoint is our strategy with media advertising. If you work in HR, you are getting calls all day long, number one, from staffing companies, right? Uh, number two, radio stations that want you to, to run ads, and then there's the whole billboard situation. So I've been recruiting too long. That to me screams running ads in the Journal Sentinel, and I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm not going to waste that money. <laughs> for to waste my money with Indeed, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> but um, I worked with our marketing team to, said, to say, what are we gonna do? Because I don't wanna put a billboard on the side of the road. I can't control the message. Um, I, I don't know who's reading it. Um, I don't think they're effective. And the same thing with commercials. 
on the radio. How many of you listen to the commercials on the radio? You're listening to Pandora or Spotify or Sirius Radio. You're not listening to all those commercials. That is a waste of my money. And so with our marketing department, we decided to partner with a major media company. Uh, so we chose Curse TV, uh, Channel 12, WISN. And what they do for us is they run commercials on their streaming services that you cannot skip. So if you are watching a show on uh, your phone or your tablet or even at home um, streaming uh, and there's commercials, they cannot fast forward through those. Additionally, what is the, the beautiful thing about that is they target people, they have an algorithm where they are targeting people looking for work. So I have never seen one of our commercials on a, a streaming service. I'm not looking for work. But it is wonderful when people come to me and say, oh, I saw a commercial. I saw one of our commercials. Oh, are you looking for work? Right. Um, so they're looking at those different algorithms, and they can pinpoint our demographics, what we're looking for in an associate, and that can keep, that's who keeps getting those messages. And um, it, it's working, I have to tell you. The other thing that we're doing, um, and I should, I'll show you just some data. So the people that actually uh, watch those videos, because they have to, and then they go and click on our website, we get some data from that. And this is an example of what that data looks like. It shows us by zip code uh, how many people had an impression that month or saw our commercial and then went to our website. And we had to hone this because they used to send our commercials, for example, to Sheboygan. Well, Sheboygan is over an hour away. I don't want people from Sheboygan. Uh, the majority of our folks come from Milwaukee, Monopoly Falls, West Bend, and so they're very, very targeted. This is very different than running a radio ad, right? It's very specific and targeted marketing person, right? So you get what I'm saying. Okay, the other thing that we do, please don't be shocked or horrified that we do this, is we do something called geofencing. And so what geofencing is doing is we are taking companies, our competitors, and we are sending our ads to those employees specifically, okay? So um, every month, do you do this already? Okay. <laughs> now, I felt okay showing you this because we're in German now. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and this one was pretty relatively um, less problematic, I'd say. Um, I told you earlier, we like manufacturing, fast food, and retail. So you will see on this list, um, manufacturers, McDonald's, Pick and Save, uh, Walmart. So we, anyone at Walmart, who is looking for a job, they currently work at Walmart, is getting our ads, okay? So every month, we get these reports, and then we review them, and we say, oh, okay, uh, you know, Pick and Save isn't warranting any clicks, we're gonna take that off the list, we're gonna add another one. This is very specific, um, uh, I guess, advertising that goes to the people that we want, versus just broadcasting it out and out of open prayer. Uh, I will tell you, it's not cheap, uh, so I will add that. I, I, if you are considering something like this, um, you probably can get it cheaper. We have a contract with First Television, uh, and so we spend about $1,000 a week to do this, so it's about $50,000 a year. However, how much do your openings cost, right? If you don't have a butt in a seat, a uh, chance for a year, it can cost more than $50,000. All right, uh, I know that Derek asked me to talk a little bit about retention, and that's a really big subject, and I probably don't have enough time to go into all the things I would like to talk about from a retention standpoint. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just tell you that we do things like, um, you know, we do stay interviews, and uh, we are looking at our employee engagement, and. Uh, we review our compensation all the time. So those are things that we're always on top of. That's just a given, that's a fundamental. The thing that we really need to talk about are growth pathways, okay? 
maybe people my age coming into the company don't care necessarily about growth and where I'm gonna go, because maybe I'm just gonna ride it out for the next 15 years, right? Uh, but as you know, that next generation that's coming in, and not only them, I'm not trying to stereotype, people want, they want to learn new things, and they want to grow, and you have to sell that, you have to walk the walk, and talk the talk, right? It's, it's not just about talking the talk if you don't bring them in and then have nowhere for them to grow. And so uh, bringing in an entry-level candidate and, um, and, and you know, getting them to a leadership position or a technical expert uh, position, there's nothing more rewarding than doing something like that. And so uh, we have spent a lot of time, energy, and effort into building out some visuals that look like this. And this shows, hey, uh, manufacturing, engineering intern, when you start as an intern, this could be your pathway. You could go into all these other areas, and it doesn't necessarily have to be leadership. It can be a technical expert. It can be the sky's the limit. But you have to be thoughtful about this, and you have to spend the time to map it out for people, and then you have to have that salesperson, whomever is selling your company, understand what the heck this is and be able to sell it. My recruiters will shadow uh, different departments, especially in engineering where it's more technically focused. They need to understand uh, what they are selling and what the opportunities are there. And so we have these visuals for every one of our, our departments, whether it's production, engineering, HR, IT, you name it, we need to be able to sell it, okay? Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up and say, uh, do we have the golden ticket? No, <laughs> we don't have a golden ticket. We are still looking for a golden ticket. I don't know that that golden ticket exists anywhere. But we, we know that what worked for us a year ago or two years ago or maybe even six months ago does not, is not necessarily going to work tomorrow. So our talent acquisition team and our HR team, we are meeting weekly to talk about what's working, what's not, let's do some brainstorming, we got to figure out something different. You have to be able to pivot on the fly, try new things, uh, you gotta, you gotta know when to walk away when they're not working as well. So um, you just, I guess, in summary, you just have to be creative. It, it, it's a evolving, fluid situation in today's marketplace for sure. Okay, I want to open it up to questions if I can, really quick, Derek. Are there any questions about anything that I've talked about today? Yes. So, in your years of experience, have you ever seen a climate? I've seen some pretty crappy climates, right? So 2001, when everybody got laid off, right after 9-11, that was pretty bad. 2008, 2009 was bad. Never have I seen anything like this. Every day, and I'm sure the HR professionals will agree with me, every day I'm like, you want how much money? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me that I'm paying you this much money to do this job? It is astonishing to me. Um, where we are today uh, and how difficult it is to find good people. It's, it's been a challenge for sure. Yeah, yes? Um, you mentioned how quick of a process recruiting needs to be in this crazy job market. So does your company do any sort of assessments prior to like interviews or offering the candidate a job or do you feel you can put that by the wayside because of the crazy market you go on gut and maybe the tools in their toolbox on their resume or when you yeah it, it's a different market so we have been down that path where we've done pre-employment assessments before uh, for our production folks we've done the wonder leg um, we've done some other tests and um, they don't it, it doesn't get us a better candidate uh, and we're spending a lot of money on it so um, so no we don't do that today and uh, there are some positions within our organization that we do do assessments in, for example, software engineering, uh, manufacturing engineering, 
we get them on the floor and have them troubleshoot some stuff. So we do have some technical aspects of our recruiting process, but uh, for production folks, we do not do that. And I'm ashamed to say, which you'll probably agree with me, uh, we're not even doing references anymore. Um, so we do references on professional employees, but not on our Joe entry level person, because it takes too long to get them back. Because people are not responding, and I cannot wait. I am going to lose that good candidate while I'm waiting for references. And I don't tell you anything anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, professional reference is what we're looking for for yeah. employment reference. So, so for professional people, we do a professional reference. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes? So when it comes to retention and engagement from your um, senior workforce mm -hmm. with this awesome climate that we're in, mm -hmm. how do you keep them from that? Uh, okay, I can talk a lot about that. I don't have a lot of time, but here's what we did do. Um, you saw earlier I said that we would bring, uh, if you include temps, we would hire like 200 people a year. And so if you're a production leader, what that means is you have a lot of disruption every day. You have temps or new people coming in every single day to your line. Your associates are getting so crabby because they have to train people who last for three days. Okay. And um, you now you not have a lot of disgruntled people, and people are quitting because they're like, nope, I'm not going to spend my time training all day long. I just want to do my job. And so um, this this took a while to get our leaders to this point, but we ended up having a Kaizen event uh, last year where we said we need to do something different. People are getting frustrated, so we developed um, what I'll call a training line. And so now all new associates at our company go into the training line. And the training line is managed by somebody who likes people. And they like to train. And uh, then we have other associates that also like people and like to train. And you're not sticking that person next to Crabby Patty Thorne. Okay? <laughs> so, oh, no, 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 sorry. But, uh, so we have hands reflected people on that group to be the trainers, right? And so, um, and so it has made a world of difference when I'm a new person and I come in, I don't have any rate expectation because we have rates that people have to meet. Now they don't have to do that on the training cell. They don't have to work overtime because they're learning. They're not working with people that say, you know, while you can. Right. <laughs> because they are saying that, don't kid yourself, right? So um, we've got this bubble over the people that are trained, and um, a couple of benefits that have come from that. Uh, we have the, the two managers of the training cells, so we have a first shift and a second shift. Um, we have now a consistent interview process. They're the ones that are interviewing everybody, and bringing in, making decisions, hiring decisions. Because previously, we would have five or 10 different managers interviewing, and that is producing a very inconsistent, you know, someone was interviewing for technical skills, someone was interviewing because they liked you, someone was interviewing because you're hot, you know? <laughs> so, um, it is what it is, right? And so, um, so now we have consistent interview process, a consistent onboarding experience, and when they're in that group, they're able to, that leader is like, oh, you'd be really good on group A, or you'd be really good on group B. And when they're ready, which usually takes about eight weeks, then they graduate onto their like new home. And what this has done for us is it has, um, before if people were gonna turn over, they would turn over probably day 35, maybe day 39. Now most of the people turn over in the first two weeks. So they figure out in those first two weeks, this isn't for me, under no pressure, right? They're in the bubble when they figure it out, versus being you know, sent out to the, into the wild, and then they decide it's not for me, and now the person that's been training you for a week is just pissed, 
um, make it so people can get time off if it's needed, but um, it's not necessarily going to cost the company a lot of money. Um, some things that we have worked with is doing pre-approved unpaid time off, giving these employees, okay, you have X amount of days, over 40 hours a week, or what have you, and um, as long as you get it pre-approved, you can have, um, you know, four, four extra days as well, four to four times. So four extra days or five extra days a week, or a year that you can take off and unpaid time off, but you're not getting points for it, but you're, um, not, it's not costing the company any money. Uh, that has worked, I've seen that work very successfully as well. And I also worked for a company where they allowed the employees to buy an extra week of vacation. So come January 1st, you, you're filling out your benefits, and one of those benefits is I want one extra week of vacation. So if you're making, um, do easy math, so if you're making $10 an hour, 40 hours a week, uh, you have a $400 uh, payroll deduction that you can deduct over that 12, uh, 52 weeks or 26 weeks, however your payroll uh, works. It's payroll deducted, but you actually have bought yourself an extra week's vacation. That was a hugely successful program. Uh, the employees felt like, you know, especially when someone first comes to a company, um, how can I get some time off? Well, I'm not going to get any vacation for, you know, until I've been here a year. And, um, you know, this is a way to, you know, and then after a year, you know, it's maybe two weeks, and so now I can get three weeks off um, after a year. One of the other things that we've done at my current company is we still offer two weeks after a year. However, you are able to use one week of that after you've been there for six months. So an employee that's just coming on, um, you know, they know that after six months they're able to use some vacation time. So that has helped. Um, strict policies, um, like I said, you know, a lot of people kind of shut away from those strict policies, but from my experience, if you make a policy and you don't stick to it, it's not a policy. So that's why I feel that if you want that, you know, add that flexibility and you have to still have those policies and you still have to stick to those policies, you just have to build that flexibility into your policy. And that seems to be a little bit, um, a little better of a situation because if an employee knows what their expectations are, but they can't meet those expectations, if you have a baby in two weeks vacation, something happens in life and they aren't able to, you know, they use that vacation quickly and they, you know, they get to that, you know, whatever it is, seven points or whatever that ends up being termination. One, you're losing an employee. You don't want to lose your employees. I mean, in most cases, you don't want to lose your employees. Um, so you want to be able to um, have some extra flexibility, but you don't want to, to not enforce your policies. Um, to me, that enforcement, whether it's an attendance policy or if it's a no cell phone on the shop floor, if you're not enforcing those policies, not only are they not policies, but they're also, um, if, if you don't enforce it, they're going to take this one and they're going to say, okay, it will it say anything about that, so I'm going to start chewing gum on the shop floor and, you know, doing whatever. That it basically, if you get an employee in, they're going to take them out of um, Flexibility uh, makes an employee feel like their life is important, too, and that the company values the employee and their family, especially important to the newer generations that are in the workforce today. They want to feel like I am important, too. Uh, competitive compensation, uh, as we've mentioned earlier today, and, you know, if you feel like you've got a decent compensation, and then you turn around and you look at it, whether it's an ID or, or uh, the newspaper or what have you, and you turn around and you see that all the other companies are now lower than you. So then you have to, you know, go through the process of trying to increase your wages because you're losing employees. You know, an employee that have, doesn't have a lot of time with us, and if they see a company that's offering an hour for an hour than what you have, they're gone. You know, it doesn't take much at all. And, um, but the problem is, is that the quality of your candidates right now, um, the, the good ones have jobs. If they are looking for a job, in a lot of cases, they're a subpar employee. They're unemployed for a reason. They're not going to stay. They're not going to have good attendance. They're, you know, and that's a, almost a bigger struggle, you know, that, that we have, um, 
more than anything. Um, but again, like I said, as you're um, increasing your wages, you turn around and you look and, and everybody else has to, has increased theirs as well, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, so what I feel is important is when you're starting to think about increasing those wages, you think about what you, if your current employees first. You, you don't want to lose those employees. Um, so you, if you're going to add to the wages, I would start with the people that you currently have. Um, because you want to make them feel like they are valued, that you want to keep them, that they um, have a purpose at your company. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't up your starting wage because in this day and age, you almost have to. But um, as we mentioned, that those these employees are wanting to, you know, they want more, they want more, they want more. You're better off to say, okay, I'm going to start you at fifteen dollars an hour, and every quarter you're going to get twenty five cents more, uh, of, you know, a twenty five cent increase if you need to X, X, X. And the reason I say that is because they're going to feel like, okay, I've got something coming, I've got something coming, I've got something coming. They're still going to see that increase, but it's not going to um, affect your your employees. And um, like, uh, sorry, what was Michelle? Like Michelle was saying, is you get your current employees that haven't gotten any bonus or any increase, and they're training and training and training. They're getting frustrated because they keep, we can't keep employees. Um, you're going to end up losing the good value employees. So we don't want to go down that way as well. Um, and then um, the other thing is, is to do almost like a train the trainer program or a mentorship program. Uh, and it does take a specific employee to be a good mentor. Um, as you were saying as well, you don't want the person over there saying, you know, this place sucks, you, know, you don't want to work here. And you know, <laughs> it should happen. And one of the things uh, I, you know, from interviewing, I hear a lot is the training program is horrible. The training program is horrible. Or, you know, I, the, the training here is horrible. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking at my current um, place of employment is how can we benefit, you know, how can we better the training program? And a lot of it is going to be through a mentorship program. And, you know, I've, I've actually sat down and really talked to our new hires that are coming in and say, what is wrong with our training? How can we better? What would you like to see in our training program? And getting that information from those new hires because, uh, you know, mentoring your employees will keep them, the new employees engaged, but it will also engage your current employees. And they're going to feel like they're doing something um, good for the company. They're going to feel good about helping somebody learn. You know, I, you know, you hear a lot about, um, in, you know, in the past, how, you know, this person really took me under their wing and made me feel welcome. They really helped me to grow. And that's important uh, when someone's walking through the doors of a new company. They're starting a job, they don't know anyone, they don't know what they're doing, they don't even know where the bathroom is, and they're nervous. And a lot of times, if they don't feel that welcome, they're going to fail. So we want to make sure that we can keep um, the new employees in and get them engaged, but we also want to take care of our current employees and teach them to mentor and, and you know, compensate them somehow to mentor your younger employees. And again, it's not going to be everyone that's going to be that mentor. I'm actually trying to get um, a group of mentors, or potential mentors together and talk about it and do, you know, and to figure out a way that we can really make our training program best, as best as it can be. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, the art of employee referrals. Um, one of the things that, I mean, employee referrals are very important. Um, people that you have currently working are going to sell your company um, if they like, if they're happy there. Um, what you want to, and what I have here is actually an example of a business card that I use for my, my employees. I make them just, you know, on Avery, you know, the Avery label type uh, thing. And it just says, I love my job, Dave is candy. We are hiring. Come fill out an application and give this card to, me, to HR. It's my referral, Jane Doe. And you you make a page, give them to your employees, and say, um, you know, if, let me do a competition. Um, this month, you know, whoever, I, whoever brings in the most referral cards, 
uh, we'll, we'll win a prize. It could be $50, it could be a day off, it could be whatever your, your thought process is. Um, you can also offer a successful recruitment bonus. Uh, I mean, you said $1,000, and I was thinking more like, you know, well, I should say that, you, you know, a couple of years ago when we were offering 100, uh, currently it's 500, but, you know, I mean, you definitely have to find out what's gonna work for your company. And then, um, but you don't want, you know, say that each employee has 10 business cards to hand out, you don't want them sitting at the local bar handing out these cards, <laughs> you know, or just standing on the street corner handing out. You want that employee to have some skin in the game. So um, you want to make sure that if they are handing this card out, that employee does know what they're, you know, know that they're going to be a valuable employee. So when you get a card back, uh, you're going to say, well, you know, hey, I got this card from John Doe. Um, how do you know them? You know, and um, have you ever worked with them? You know, why would you think that they're going to be a good fit for this company? So that they understand that they're, you know, if this person works out, it's going to be a benefit to, to the company and to me. If this person doesn't work out, they're, you know, my my image is on the line. I certainly don't want to be thinking poorly of me. So. Uh, if they have some skin in the game, they're going to make sure that whoever they refer to you hopefully will be a benefit um, to the company. Um, and then the last thing that I do, I just posted something the other day for an employee that, um, you know, Suzy Q has just earned a $500 bonus for successful recruit of John Doe. Um, so there's you know, employee recognition on the board, and it's, you know, it, it can, it's like, wow, well, I want five hundred dollars. Who do I know that can, you know, can come to the company and work? Um, so these are just some ideas uh, that I've used in the past um, that have been successful. You know, they might work for your company, they might not. And you know, I have a lot of different manufacturer. A lot of them from manufacturing environment. Um, a lot of different companies have, you know, different reasons why some will or won't work. But I hope that there was some uh, valuable information. A little bit about us. Um, we are owned by a private family. They are based out of Kansas City. Um, they purchased us on 12-31 of 2018. Um, so we're going into our um, fourth year, right? Fifth year of ownership. Um, awesome family. Awesome family. Completely and totally engaged with our workforce, right? Um, know their names when they come on site, care about the benefits that they offer. Um, they, they will go out and they'll walk the floor and go up to people, they remember their names, right? Awesome, awesome engagement. There we go, okay. So if you're like me, you want to see the stats, right? You want to see the stats. So hires, we'll call them departures for various reasons. Some are retirement, some moved out of the area, some it was um, an apprenticeship in this, they went to school, right? Um, a lot of different reasons. So I am going to toot my own horn here. That is all me. Right? That is all me. I'm super, super excited about it. Um, and if we look over since 2018 on the new hires that we've had, it's about a 34% retention rate right now. So with the climate that we're in, I wish it was better, but I am going to say I'm, I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm super excited. So one more staff. So right now, and we're just in May, I'm at 86% for retention. Obviously, the goal is always 90, right? It's not better. Um, when I think about, and look at, in COVID, I was 97. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry. When I think about what it really takes to get these statistics, um, to to say this, um, it's patience. It's it's a lot of patience, a lot of customer service orientation in the way that I deal with our workforce on all levels, right? Professionals, production, 
executive management, ownership. Um, if you don't have the customer service mentality to approach every situation with patience and kindness and focus, it's going to come through in your staff, right? It's going to come through. Okay, so a few things here. So on to my notes. As you heard the questions that I asked um, with the other panelists, if you don't identify a problem that you know that you have and try to work through the issues that you have with that problem, you're never going to know. Right? So, as the students were up here, um, four things that I wrote down that I took from what they said was endurance, interest, empathy, and focus. So when somebody comes up to you and you can tell they're having a bad day, right? It's usually pretty obvious, no matter what level they are in the organization, it's really important to listen to what they have to say and then go above and beyond of what they just said and, and, and try to pull it out. And then resonate that with them because then they can tell one, you listened to them. Two, are you gonna fix it right then and there? Probably not. But they're not looking for you to fix it. And a quick fix probably isn't a good idea either. They're looking for you to have listened to them and, and retain what they said and then hopefully they're not coming to you again with the same issue, right? So, let's get back to this. Sorry, I wanted to talk about that quick. In-house recruiting. As Michelle said, who is your seller? I do a really good job selling. Really good. So, if there is anybody that is excited about Swiss Tech, it is me, and it comes out as I'm recruiting. Right? So, I was just joking with somebody earlier when we had our break. Last year, July, on my honeymoon, the phone rings. It was Chris. He was calling to follow up with some mock interview stuff, I think, what have you. So that is a real recruiter, man. She answers her phone on her honeymoon. <laughs> Brother 
brothers, sisters, mom, dad, um, husband and wives. Um, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have one family where we have four siblings and a sister-in-law, right? Uh, again, the stable ownership. Um, when I conduct interviews, especially for my professional roles, and they ask about our ownership and the development within the organization and so on and so forth, the fact that I am able to say they are a long-term holder and there's no plan at all to sell or what have you, it, that, that's like saying you just gave me a golden ticket. Right? The stability in that ownership group. Because believe it or not, if you also if you research some of the professionals um, of why they left this organization or that organization, I can almost guarantee somebody that's in their 40s did leave an organization or was dis, um, displaced from an organization because of a sale. And they never want to do that again. Right? They never want to do that again. Um, growth interview questions. So what do I mean by that? One question I ask every candidate, whether it's a high school person or a um, maybe a person that's already been in a production environment or a professional, what does your ideal work environment look like? Because your ideal work environment and my ideal work environment really be two different things. And if you tell me you like to be outside, red light. <laughs> I don't have anything to do outside, right? And so then you can get into further depth as to, well, why do you think working outside is something that you really enjoy? It really, again, it's that psychological understanding of your applicant. Um, another thing I'd like to ask, especially professionals, how do you feel you can grow within our organization? Because again, like we've already discussed, a lot of people coming into our workforce right now want to know there's growth and want to know that they have a future. It is up to us to mentor them so that they understand that they play a primary role in that growth. If you don't encourage them to think that way, they're going to continue to think it's all on the employer. You have to plant the seeds to get them to think of how can, how can they also contribute to the situation. CI development, continuous improvement, right? Every person in our organization has done yellow belt training. Along with the fact that all of our engineers, all of our quality, green belt. Furthermore, any projects that we do follow the domain process, the due measure, um, oh, it's the failing me. Improvement, measure, analyze, analyze, control. Analyze, yes, improve, right? Yeah, sorry. In control, in control. So on those projects, all levels of employees, all levels of engagement, because everyone's perspective is that important. Again, that's how you're engaging the entire workforce so that they all know they're on a level playing field. Everyone's role is just as important as the other. <coughs> Leadership. This one is really important to me. Horizontal with the vertical. So you have your managers, right? Just because somebody is in a horizontal, is in a just because you and I are in a horizontal relationship does not mean that we can't be a leader to the other. Doesn't mean that at all. So with that, we do leadership training. Um, we are very, very fortunate that our ownership group has different platforms that they are invested in. One of them is online education or digital education. We have a platform that we utilize that has videos in English and in Spanish um, for leadership training. And a lot of focus on that is how you, as an inspector, 
as a quality engineer, as a second person that's in secondary operations, how standing up and saying, you know, stop, I don't think that what I'm doing right here is probably the right process, or these parts are bad, so I'm gonna stop the machine right now. That is leadership, right? Common sense isn't common. So finally, um, personnel transparency. Quarterly town halls, we walk the floor. I walk the floor all the time. I bet you 50% of my workforce doesn't even know where my office is because when they need something, they just ask me when I'm on the floor. And that's how it should be. That's that customer service mentality. Um, and then two, um, customer information. So, again, engagement. So I took the name and just put sample up there. But um, this organization that we work with, this is one of our customers, and they make these electrodes that go into your brain for epilepsy and stuff like that. So one of the biggest industries that we are in is medical. So two things. One, English and Spanish and everything. 50% of my workforce, third person language is Spanish, right? Second thing, if this doesn't give you a drive to make, like I am making a thing that's gonna go into somebody's brain, like that's a mission, that's awesome. On our website, you'll see that we say that we make mission critical applications.